Uh, normally we'll do the panel kind of at the end of all the plenary sessions and we'll reflect on all of the sessions, but we thought this year it might be helpful to do the panel kind of in the middle of the conference. So, uh, and we thought that it might be useful to talk about something that if you've been a pastor for, let's say, longer than 10 minutes, <laughs> which I think is probably everybody who's a pastor in the room. You got hired in the last, well, Rick, and, no. If you've been a pastor for at least 10 minutes, you know a little something about, and that's criticism. You've experienced it. And we're not interested, these guys aren't interested in just sitting here and licking our wounds, kind of complaining about this glorious calling that God has put on their lives, uh, not least because we carry out this vocation, you carry out this vocation in a country where serving as a pastor poses very little threat to your well-being and where you're compensated far better than most of our brothers who serve all around the world, aren't we? So we, we're not here to lick our wounds, but we are, are here to name something, describe something, try to give help for this thing that most of you know a little something about, criticism. And we're hoping their answers, our discussion, will God will use to point your eyes back on what your hope is. Our only hope in life and death and pastoral ministry is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're hoping these answers, this discussion, put, puts a little fresh faith in your heart, energy in your soul as you head back into the hurly-burly of pastoral life. So that's our prayer. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to take about an hour, and I'm going to ask these gentlemen some questions. So would you pray with me as we begin? Lord, we are, and we've been praying this way too, we are so eager for these uh, friends that sit in this auditorium to experience your tremendous goodness. You are a generous giver of gifts, displayed demonstrably, undeniably, in giving us your very precious son. And how will you not with him freely give us all things like help and encouragement and instruction in the midst of criticism? And so we are eager to experience the goodness of being your sons and daughters. We, we want to experience the blessing of being in your family. So would you help us today? Help these men as they talk. I pray that their answers, their stories would be faith-building, life-giving, joy-restoring for the folks in this room. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you guys ready for this? All right, let's go. Here's, we're gonna start with an easy one. Uh, you guys ever done anything that deserved criticism? <laughs> Maybe something dumb. Why don't you tell us a little story, what comes to your mind? You've done something that deserved criticism. Tell us about it, what'd you learn? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. In the mid-80s, I had a staff member who was quite obese. And uh, I didn't think at all about her being in the audience. And I was preaching a message on um, self-control and had a section in the sermon on gluttony. And I think gluttony is a sin. I think it... Self-control is a good thing, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But here's the mistake, and so please learn from this. I equated gluttony and obesity. Yeah. Mm. That's a mistake. Mm. That's a serious mistake. Um, and so here I am preaching to several hundred folks, uh, not thinking too much about who was overweight and who wasn't, but making that 
identification that the sin I'm talking about was virtually the same as their present weight. Well, she confronted me boldly and uh, compellingly with reasons. That's not true, Pastor. You have no idea of the causes of obesity in your church. You just do not understand. The reasons are many. Some have to do with diabetes. Some have to do with trauma. Some have just all kinds of complexities that go into why people are the weight they are. You cannot draw a straight line between gluttony and obesity. And I just, I just melted. I mean, I was, I was just guilty as charged so clearly that I have profusely apologized. And I don't think I've ever made that particular mistake again. Hmm. I have youth ministry in my background. And one time at Jubilee, no longer in the youth ministry context, we're still running these uh, Olympic style games at our family camp. And I had the bright idea of playing steal the bacon with the church, but with actual bacon. L literal bacon. You typically use steal the bacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got it, right, yeah. So th that's the youth pastor inside of me, just maybe. But it was, was the thing about it whatsoever. And I had a mother come to me, rightfully so, on the other side of it, upset that we were using actually raw meat to play this game <laughs> with her child. It didn't even dawn on me not to not use raw meat. The game is called steal the bacon. I mean, come on. Like it felt like it was a brainchild to say, yeah, we should use bacon. <laughs> Where the critique, the critique was right. Mm -hmm. And what it taught me was to be really aware of mm -hmm. beautiful folks in our congregation like parents yeah. who just have a Another mindset, because I didn't have kids at that time, mm -hmm. but just opening up an awareness of the various, the, the variety of people within the mix and running some things by some folks mm -hmm. and try to open up the mind and say, yeah, this may be a bright idea to me, this brainchild of mine, mm -hmm. and really have no insight in terms of how this might impact mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. uh, something I thought was going to be fun and, and yeah childish, mm -hmm. it really did hurt her feelings and it, it reminded me, I got to have my eyes open a little bit wider mm -hmm. for those in the mix that may take mm -hmm. this a different way. <laughs> the most common form of criticism I get is for things that I have either missaid or said wrongly or failed to say in teaching. I think of one instance where teaching on the fatherhood of God I finished and afterwards spoke to a girl who was in tears who said to me, this is precisely my problem with God mm. because my father abused me. So that's all I hear when you talk about the fatherhood of God. And what that woke me up to was how people can hear because of their experiences something so different to what you mean or what is scriptural intent and so to preach accurately to real people there needs to be an awareness an attempt at an awareness mm -hmm. of where people are and where they might therefore misunderstand sometimes with tragic consequences something that you can see as a beautiful truth. And therefore, there's a need to be able to not only proclaim the truth, but articulate it in such a way that they're understanding how it is different to the lie that is crushing them and how it actually liberates. So for that girl, there was wonderful good news about the fatherhood of God, God's fatherhood being good news and the fact that she couldn't hear it was because she'd worked the wrong way around. She'd projected her abusive idea of fatherhood into heaven, mm. whereas her father is called father because he should have been like the father in heaven. And that's why it hurt, mm. because he wasn't. Mm. Yeah, so what's your solution when you're preaching on the fatherhood of God? So the solution is I need to 
talk people through how to do theology. That you don't project onto God your own assumptions about how things are. You need to reconceive in the light of how God reveals himself to be. So you work from God down to us rather than us up to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I just, I don't want these guys to feel like you are responsible for every way that you're heard. That will paralyze you because I would say in a group of a hundred folks, any sentence you speak will be taken wrongly by somebody. And I think you're exactly right that you do everything you can within the time frame that you have and within reasonable limits to remove misunderstandings. But if, if you're going to speak in public, you, you must settle it. You will be wrongly heard. And that means that you're going to have to do some cleanup work, yeah. I think, regularly. And you have to have a skin that's thick enough to say, what you heard is not what I said. And if you're going to take me to task for that, I will own as much as I can. Mm. But I can't be responsible for your misunderstandings. Mm-hmm. You, you get to have the, somewhere in there, there's a, a, you, you, you will be destroyed yeah. by people's using their emotional response to what you say to damn you or ruin you. And there must be a distinction between what I said was this, what I meant was this, you heard it as that, that's not what I said, I'm sorry you misunderstood, here's my clarification. And if that doesn't do it, that's not on you. Yeah. And you, and you can tell the difference. I mean, John shouldn't have equated gluttony with obesity. So he wasn't, you weren't misheard. That's different than Michael's where, okay, you don't know how everything's going to land. You said true things about God. So that's an interesting little distinction there. And there's a a difference according to context. So in a particularly small local church, and the longer you've served there, the more you will tend to know people's situations and you'll be able to speak that way. But the more publicly you're speaking, the more people who Mm. you don't get to interact with, you don't know who they are, the more the potential for that misunderstanding. The classic, of course, being social media, where almost whatever you say, someone is going to profoundly misunderstand you. Yeah, and we'll get to social media in just a little bit. Stephen or David, any dumb things you've done? <laughs> Come on, don't, I mean, we want to hear it. Yeah, Let's no, be honest. No dumb things. Uh, no dumb <laughs> Is of Stephanie course. in the room? Where is yeah, she? she's okay. not here, thankfully. Right. Uh, less dumb, but just when you make a mistake, right? what do you do with it? right? So three weeks ago, I was preaching, I was humming along, and I was trying to quote Romans 8.28 from memory. You're in the midst of the sermon. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. But in the second service, I just blanked, like could not pull it up at all, like nothing on my mind. And I'm thinking, I don't have it. I I just don't have it. So one of my elders is sitting in the front row there. Tim Johnson, help me out here. (laughs) Romans 8, 28. (laughs) And he's kind of like on the spot. You know, usually the preacher doesn't talk to you when he's preaching. Um... (laughs) And so, like, people are saying it all around, and eventually I get it, right? And so I finish this sermon, I'm walking down to my seat, and here, here's the moment. What do you do, right? Do you just kind of retreat and think, oh, that was so miserable, which it was. It, it was embarrassing. And I think, it's not about me in this moment. How do I help the people? Mm-hmm. And so at the benediction, I say, and that promise, and I finally recite it, you know, as it should be recited, and I say, that promise is true whether you remember it or not. <laughs> good. And God is wow, good. And amen. the whole point of the sermon was God is faithful hmm. to his promises. And so uh, in, in that moment, I had to make a decision, though, to say, I'm not going to make this about me in this moment, but how do I serve my people? That's good. That's good. You know something dumb? Let's go. <clears throat> From my wife's first birthday when we were newlyweds, we didn't have a lot of money. I'm thinking... $50 seems like a, a good amount for this present. And she had expressed interest in having a sewing machine at some point. And I realized $50 is not going to get a sewing machine. 
And so I made a beautiful little coupon. This $50 toward a sewing machine and gave it to my wife. And uh, I thought this was just, this was efficient. This was miserly. Uh, I mean, from all angles that I could see it, like this was a very smart gift. And uh, she did not take it that no, way. No. And offered some criticism. And she was absolutely right. And I needed to hear it. And I've heard various versions of it because I'm thick headed. Uh, but my wife's birthday gift is not about me making efficient decisions of my calculus, uh, but what would express love So I don't get it. I, what's wrong with the gift? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I had learned from John. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, what is it about being a human that makes criticism hard to receive? You're humans. I'm imagining if you're like me, criticism is that's hard to take. What is it? Talk, what, what are the things that are going on in our hearts that make that sting? Pride. Yeah. Yeah, that's Anecdotally right. Anecdotally speak for myself. Yeah. I think, of, I think of an article that I gladly gave to anybody that would take it from our church who was struggling with criticism, criticism in marriage or criticism at the job. And it was a CCEF article, and it said something to the effect of that the gospel is so powerful that of all people in the world, Christians should be the ones who could take criticism. Mm -hmm. Because in the gospel, you've been critiqued more than you will ever mm -hmm. be critiqued. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that anybody can say in this room that critiques me like the gospel. And in the gospel, you've been validated and accepted more than anybody on this planet will be able to validate. Mm -hmm. So I said, give this thing out like, Flacky, you need to read this. This is <laughs> excellent. Until it came my time to receive criticism. <laughs> and it shocked me of how bad I was in applying that, applying that truth. Mm -hmm. The gospel gives me the foundation to receive this criticism. Mm -hmm. But the pride in my heart was saying, I don't need, you should be talking to me like this. Who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. Mm. It was pride. Pride, right. I th for me, is yeah. going to be one of the biggest roadblocks when it comes down to so being able to m move through the hurt of criticism, get to the truth there, receive it, and then keep, keep on learning from it. David Pallison, is that I the... I think that was okay, the David Okay, that would be a good one yep. for you guys to Google, not now. David Pallison responding to criticism. Responding to criticism, CCF article. Yeah. 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 The, home run. It, it is a home run. Yeah, that's I just give it out to everybody, and, and it was hard to, to take good. my own that medicine. Michael. I'd say, um, very much connected to that, poor knowledge of God. Mm. For when, when God is glorious to you, and I don't mean you understand the doctrines of grace and you can uh, comprehend a certain understanding of God's majesty, but when God is glorious to you, majestic, beautiful, treasured, then when God is big in your perspective, more than big, beautiful, glorious, then criticism of him stings and hurts. When he is impugned, that hurts. But when you are criticized, it hurts far less because your perspective is filled with him. But when your knowledge of God is small and slight and you are bored of God or you think God is small, unworthy, then what naturally happens is your view of yourself, your pride, gets bigger, and the bigger your view of yourself, the more susceptible you are to the opinions of others. And that works actually with both criticism and flattery. Mm. Mm. Either way, I just care too much what people think of me. But when God is glorious, I'm caring more about what people think of him, what they're making of him, and that's really, it's not so much about thick skin mm. as such. It's really perspective. What do you care about? What, what is filling your vision will really determine uh, how you respond to criticism and flattery. And so, of course, most people, sinners, are going to take criticism as 
as a painful attack because they are filling their own perspective and what other people think of them is all important. The only solution is I must decrease, he must increase. Mm. Mm. Amen. Other thoughts on this? Things that make criticism sting. Your view of God is too small, correlated. Your view of yourself is too big. Other thoughts? Anything else kind of come to mind? Well, I don't know if, if it would be different, but the, the biblical foundation for what Michael just said with regard to criticism and flattery is found in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, and then 6, 1 to 16. So 5, 11 and 12 is uh, rejoice when people criticize you, mm -hmm. all right? Say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So the solution to being crushed by that slander is joy in the reward. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same for the protection against the love of praise in chapter 6. So don't do your alms to be seen by men. Don't pray to be seen by men. Don't fast to be seen by men. Because if you do, you lose your reward. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So in both texts, the solution to loving the praise of men or being crushed by the criticism of man is the reward of the Father. So f falling f deeper and deeper in love, having, having the source of your pleasure flow so much from God that the pleasure we get from the praise of men is small enough that it doesn't crush you when you don't get it and it doesn't make you greedy for it. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's the thing that complicates the matter. Um, a thing that complicates the matter. There is something, a little speck of goodness in the love of the praise of man. Mm -hmm. Because there is a godly way to hear the Lord say, well done, mm -hmm. good and faithful servant. He does not mean for us, when he says that to us, well done, good and faithful servant, he doesn't mean, don't tempt me like that. That's bad news. I'm not supposed to enjoy that. Well, you are supposed to enjoy that. So there, th why is it right to enjoy the father saying, well done, but not to crave, please tell me I did a good job. Please tell me I did a good job. I'm so needy, 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 needy of your praise. And so I sow that seed to say, find the, the seed of goodness and when you are, when at the end of a sermon, when, a, when somebody comes up to you and says, Pastor, that was so helpful. That was extraordinarily helpful this morning. You, you don't belittle that. Mm. You don't blow that off and say, oh, you, you shouldn't say that to me. And oh, it was all of the Lord. Here's what I say. Just say, thank you. Just say, thank you. That means a lot to me. That was encouraging to me. Turn it back and, and receive it. It is right to receive godly praise. And, and it's dangerous as all get out to love it, to love praise. I'm curious, did you see in your ministry, did you grow in this? Do you, do you remember any sort of recognizable seasons where you began to, okay, I'm, I'm receiving praise in the right way. Criticism is hurting less. Maybe encourage these guys. I'm hoping this, the answer is yes, you did grow in it. If he says no, that's a bad line of questioning. Well, the, 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 the safe way to answer the question is the way I did it. Table talk a minute ago, one of the guys said, when will I get beyond the struggle? I said, never. Okay. Till Jesus comes or you're dead. Because I, I don't think sanct sanctification works that way. Yeah. I think John Piper will be a proud man until he's gone. The indwelling sin mm -hmm. has to be daily crucified, mm -hmm. regularly put to death. So I think what, what, what I learned was a few things about how to receive praise better. Because mm -hmm. I think theologically, my first thought was since um, everything good that John Piper does, that has any speck of goodness in it, it is of God. Mm -hmm. I still believe that. Mm -hmm. But having come through this channel, it is clear that the Bible is willing to bless human beings who do good things. Yeah. And God himself rewards human beings for doing good things. He writes everything down according to Ephesians 6, 8, you will receive back for every good deed. Isn't that amazing? Every good deed you're going to receive back. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So he's writing it all 
all down, and that's a, that's a good thing. And I think I learned to, it, it, there are humble ways to receive mm -hmm. thanks mm -hmm. and praise. A doubt that I've, I've grown too much mm -hmm. in my um, delight in the praise of man. I think that still tastes very good, mm -hmm. and I must regularly do the, the God work mm -hmm. of reorienting my heart on, on God. It serves us to hear you say that. Thank you. Michael. There are two ways in which we grow. The first is through Scripture, primarily, learning to know and cherish God more so that he becomes greater to us and we become less. But there is a second means in which we grow that we can have a theoretical sense and it doesn't seem theoretical to us, a theoretical sense of the gloriousness of God that when life is easy, we can hold to it and, and think we hold to it firmly. And the second way we grow is the Lord brings afflictions our way in order to disabuse us of the, the vain things of the world. Mm. And that is the hard part. But what that, the afflictions where you, you find your pride and your anger and your sinfulness awakened by criticisms or hard times, what that, what that does is it shows the difference between a mere sense of the truth and an appreciation of it in reality. Mm -hmm. And so God kindly, providentially, sends us and sanctifies for us afflictions mm -hmm. so that our appreciation of what we might cerebrally hold grows. And therefore, we shouldn't be too scared of the afflictions and the pain that come with these things. Mm. Because the Lord, for those who keep in step with the Spirit, the Lord sanctifies these afflictions, mm. making the very ugly traits in our character beautified. Mm. That's a good word. Any other thoughts on why criticism can sting? Any, any kind of personal, we don't have to press this. I feel like we, that was helpful. John? I'm pretty experienced with this. You know? Yeah, okay. I, mean, I, I, I dislike being criticized by my wife um, and that we haven't stirred in. And, and here's, here's one of the main reasons is, look, if you're gonna say that about me, what about this? Yeah. That's the dynamic we haven't brought up yet. The critic is imperfect, and you know it. Yeah. Can't you own that? I mean, if you, you know, if, if, you, if you knew how many times I didn't. And that, that's a dynamic that I think bring, brings in a, a, a kind of another dimension of love. Mm -hmm. I don't talk too much about love toward a person. Mm -hmm. So Noel is my most cherished. 55 years of, of ripening cherishing. And few people can hurt me more. And me, her, right? We've been through some deep waters together on this. And therefore, I think a, a strategy of is to not do that. And, and I think, I forget who said it now, that for me to know how much I have for, been forgiven mm. by Jesus mm. is the key to my forgiving, mm. my disposition of letting it go, not holding it against her, being re returning good for evil which it may not, for her angle, it wasn't evil at all. She was just saying it, and, and I'm, I'm feeling it as evil. She didn't feel it as evil. Get over it. 
And, and so this, this vertical dimension of I would be, I mean, this is a good day because I'm not in hell, right? I, I am being blessed by the Lord. I sit here in this house that we own. I have running water. I have indoor plumbing. I have refrigeration. I have doctors healing every disease. I, I am so overwhelmed with paradise in America. And here I am upset with a word. Come on, Piper. Get real. So mm. that dynamic of the other person mm -hmm. also being a, her feet, feet of clay, mm -hmm. and you tend to, as soon as she says something negative about you, you get 10 things negative about her. Mm -hmm. That's just evil. That'll destroy a lot of relationships, mm -hmm. ruins a lot of marriages. Mm. That's right. If we only receive criticism from people that are immune to it, they're perfect, then we'll never receive it from anybody because everybody's a sinner. That's right. That's helpful. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Sources of criticism. You get criticized from different sources. One of those might be from your congregation criticizing you about your preaching. Has that ever happened to you guys? Where do you go with that? How do you respond to that? I suspect a lot of these guys out there, that's an experience they have uh, more frequently than they'd like to admit. Talk about pr criticism from the congregation about your preaching. I'm always ready to go. It's like an Ask Pastor John episode. <laughs> Speaking Our of that, first, I... First year in, a deacon comes up to me with his wife, and, and he looks at us and says, we're, we're probably leaving, leaving the church. They've been there for 10 years. I've been there for six months. And, and I say, what? She says, everything you say goes over my head. I don't understand a thing you say. Mm. And, and he's kind of there... Yeah, I like it. <laughs> so I missed it. I mean, they left the church. Um, I was not connecting with this lady, and, and we never quite figured it out, but her language was just over my head. And, and, and it could be, I mean, everything I ever said at Bethlehem's online, so you can go back and test whether the 80, 81, 82 sermons were too heady, um, but they were for her, for sure. And, and I... I could have perhaps done better for her. So that's one kind of criticism. Let me just give you two, two other bullet points real quick. So, I mean, I've heard a lot of things. So I, <laughs> I, I, I preached a sermon and I wrote an article one time just called Missions and Masturbation. Now this is not smart in a church of mainly older people <laughs> and a lot of them single women. And one lady comes up she, said, she took my hand after and said, Pastor, you're sick. <laughs> so that's another illustration. We can follow up on these if you want. And then, and then we had a big, a big debacle over, over, over an immorality in the church. And, and a, an elder's wife just came up to me after one of the meetings where we were arguing about how the church had handled it. And she, she, she didn't take my hand. She looked at me and said, you're the most arrogant person I have ever known. You are the most arrogant. Her husband's standing right there. I still know her husband well to this day. We're good friends. I, I haven't had much of a relationship with her. So you're sick, you're arrogant, and everything you say goes my head. Mm. Last year uh, was the first time that I could recall in the role that I have at the church of receiving criticism on a sermon that I took really personally. Mm. Um, it was communicated in, in a way that the thought was things I was saying in the sermon was a attack on, okay. on them. And going back to not being able to be in charge of everybody's perception, the biggest thing I wanted to do is to be able to turn around and say, by no means am I using the pulpit as a means of attacking the flock and attacking the sheep from the pulpit. But the, it, it once again took me by surprise because what I would have hoped to have done in that scenario is just to unpack what I meant by it, but I took it very, it was, mm -hmm. it, it, it felt personal to the gut, mm -hmm. to the core. And I think it connected because these are people that we love, we've known each other, walked with each other yeah. for a while. Yeah. And for that thought to, that thought to come into your mind, like, I, hey, we, we've been doing this for a while. You know me, I love you. I love you. Yeah. You love me, we love one another. Mm. Uh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case. Mm. But that, that would be an example that comes to my mind when I think of mm. somebody hearing something in the sermon 
and hearing it in such a way that I come across in a way mm -hmm. as attacking them, mm -hmm. which is which is difficult to hear. And I, and I can imagine you 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 know it is you spend your week doing all kinds of stuff, eking out a little time to write a sermon. You put your heart into the time you got. You're loving your people. And for someone to say, look, that went over my head, or that wasn't helpful, or you orchestrated that to attack me, it stings because you want to say, man, I love you. I'm giving myself to you. And we expect, and we kind of think they owe us, don't we? They owe us to love us because of what we're doing for them, which is uh, a misplaced uh, expectation. Stephen, you were going to say something. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, related to just general criticism on preaching, but just criticism in general, you know, like 2020, 2021, criticism came in every direction, right? Like you're making us wear masks, or I can't believe you're not kicking out the people who aren't wearing the masks, or all of those other things. And I think one of the things that is really helpful to remember in the midst of all that is just having elders that you can go back to to say, hey, are we aligned in how we're doing this? And then give me feedback if I'm misspeaking, leading poorly, so that you're not just on an island by yourself. Um, and I think that's always helpful. And then w with preaching, uh, I almost go to this text every time just to remind myself if, if criticism comes, you know, usually on the drive home, it's thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that came. And Lord, I hand over the criticism that came as well. And the text that comes to mind is Isaiah 55. For the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Amen. And so you just say, Lord, I trust that you use that to feed the right people, to water the right grass, and I'm going to leave it there. And, and, and certainly there's going to be criticisms that are merited mm. and, and you bring that to your elders to say, okay, is there something I need to learn from this or is it something that words for the wind, things I can just toss mm -hmm. and, and don't uh, need to sit with me. Mm. So it's mm. helpful. How about uh, avenues for kind of giving people an opportunity to provide feedback? So I know we're talking about, all right, you receive it. Maybe it's an email. Maybe someone's coming up in your face. Uh, what avenues, what strategies have you put in place that actually welcome and seek for people to give you feedback of kind of honest kinds? Anything. Help these guys out with yeah, that. Yeah, so what we do at our church is we'll have a sermon review meeting every Wednesday and all the, uh, several of the associate pastors will gather and we'll just say, these are the things that you did well, brother. Like, so encouraged, praise the Lord. That was so good how you did that. And then these are the things, ah, that was distracting. I, I don't think you should have lingered there. I don't think you should have said that. And just inviting the staff, uh, it, you know, we have a team of preachers and so everyone gets to kind of get feedback, but I think that's so helpful. So you're getting it from the people who know that you're doing the work, mm -hmm. who saw the outline on the front end, and then now can really share feedback in love. Because it's always hard when it's a random person, you don't know who they are, it's an email. Um, and so that's been really helpful is just having a staff Staff that's uh, developed that muscle to say, let's mm -hmm. encourage one another, let's mm -hmm. praise God for the, how the word worked, and then also help each other and sharpen mm -hmm. each other. So that, that's an intentional. Did thing. it take a while to develop a culture where people were willing to say, all right, Steve, I mean, we're, we're Minnesotans, so we kind of don't always say things straightforwardly. Did it take a little while? Yeah, it, it, it still takes yeah, yeah. some work, right? Yeah. You gotta cultivate that. And, and then you gotta not rise up and say, well, this is why I did what, you know, you just gotta say, okay, let me think on that, right? Yeah. Um, my, my wife says my favorite pet is the elephant in the room. And so like, let's always try to call it out whenever you get a chance to say, okay, like uh -huh. how did that land? Because for half of our people, they really appreciated that. When you said that they all clapped, but the other half was, you know, upset and angry. And so just helping, getting your staff to help you see the blind spots that you have. Mm -hmm. The use of the word culture there, I think is important because culture cannot be created with a single deposit of information or a single meeting. Culture is something that needs to be worked on constantly. And the first thing that creates a culture shaped by the gospel is the constant teaching of the gospel, mm. which humbles us and therefore puts us in a place where we can receive the criticism humbly and rightly. The second thing I think is then being constantly intentional in that. So with my staff, I am 
constantly saying that we want to have a culture of gracious honesty here, which is a two-way street. So I want you to tell me if there's something I'm doing that seems off to you, that seems unwise to you, some way in which you think I can do better. I want you to tell me that. But it's a two-way street, and I want you to be prepared that I would like, in love, to be able to say the same to you. If I can see something in you, I want to be able to address it and not for you to feel he's out to get me and he's just attacking me, but I seek to build you up in love mm. through constructively critiquing. Mm. And the lead guy determines the culture of that. Mm -hmm. And if he can't take it, it won't happen because everyone will know he me he says that, but he can't take it, and so we'll we'll shut up. Mm. I was thought on team preaching, <clears throat> something that has emerged naturally for us in these years of preaching together is uh, we come to a point. I'm working on this sermon, thinking about am I going to say this or not as an application of this text. Uh, being well aware of the brothers on the elder council and the fellow preachers. Uh, can be very helpful in terms of uh, having brothers to refer to ahead of time. So sermon review, mm. and we can grow in our sermon review after the fact. Uh, but one thing we've learned to do uh, leading up to sermons, there, there are times where we've shared whole manuscripts on a certain topic. Sometimes it'll just be a paragraph. Sometimes it'll be a thought. Uh, brother, what do you think about this application? This could step on your toes. I don't mean just to step on your toes unless it need to be stepped on, but help me craft this ahead of time. And that has been uh, something helpful. It's not happening on an every week basis, but being aware of each other helps us try to get at that ahead of time in some of the things that may be misunderstood. Mm. Lou, do you guys have any kind of sermon review, you and Toph and the guys? Yep. So okay. just at our staff meeting also every week, we'll go over a sermon review. It'll be a time for us to think about, think about the text. Um, we also, in partnership with Bethlehem College and Seminary, are apprentices. We have a preaching apprenticeship where we also will go a little bit more deeper. The, pre the preaching apprenticeship is a place where it's not as hard to get the, the feedback. I think we try to covenant with one another to say, let's give ourselves the feedback that's necessary so we can grow in our preaching. So those are two, two mechanisms that we have set up. How about you, John? Did, was there a feedback loop on your preaching ministry at Bethlehem? Nothing formal. We okay. never did it formally. I, I heard plenty. Um, okay. uh, but what I wanted to, to, to follow up on was what, where your question was going was, how do you create opportunities for the people mm -hmm. to criticize, not just the staff? And I would say three things. Number one, in your preaching, it will be evident to your people if you are vulnerable and imperfect. So I, at, at great risk, share painful things about my life. Mm. To, sometimes to, 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 I have to be careful, right? Because I'm, I'm more easily open than people around me are. Um, so that's one. They, they will know if you talk about your own discouragements, if you talk about your own marriage issues and your own counseling issues and other things, th they will feel like I, he might be approachable because I'm a pretty intimidating guy. I mean, that's one of the criticisms is that I'm, I can easily shut down a group because I, I just pff, too, too strong. So that's one. Communicate with, without becoming self-centered in your preaching. Let them know your feet of clay. Number two, popcorn with the pastor. Regular gatherings, maybe quarterly, after service, Wednesday night, Sunday, Sunday dinner, whatever, where, where you, everything is game here. Here's the staff in front of you. Ask us absolutely anything you want. That's number two. And number three, I suppose as, as long as we were in our new sanctuary, I don't remember doing it too much in the old sanctuary. So for 20 years plus, I said to the people, I'll be here in front, and, and I would like to pray with you about absolutely anything between services. I'll be here 20 minutes after service. I'll stay all afternoon, and I would usually be there for an hour. Mm -hmm. And that, the, the people that would line up, they, they came with everything. They came with their criticisms. They came with their questions. They came with their prayers. They came with their struggles with pornography. Mm -hmm. I just think that that is a very efficient use of your time 
to make yourself available to your people after you preach for an hour or whatever it takes uh, and let them just weep or mm. fume at you. Mm. Uh, so those are, those are three ways I think you can create a, mm. a culture for your people of mm. our pastors are approachable, even though he's a, he's a big shot and he preaches with authority, he's got feet of clay and he's willing to stand there for an hour afterwards and listen to our people. Mm. That's good. We talked about criticism of your preaching from a congregation. What about criticism and sort of conflict uh, within your elder team? How, how do you guys navigate that? What advice could you give to these fellows? Sometimes that's a particularly devastating kind of criticism is when you get it from one of your mates, your band of brothers. Talk about that a little bit. What, what advice, what comfort could you give? I think the, the, the relational debt that you share with your brothers on the elder board is going to be one of the ways that you can take the shock of criticism. Mm -hmm. Your brother, Mind Yotas, we were talking about this driving in today about how if there's relational girth there, when that shot comes, that you can, you can receive it. You can get into the argument that you might get into, or you can exchange the sharp words, but because there's relational debt that's been developed, um, it, it, helps, it helps swallow it down. So uh, an idea that he was sharing with me that I think he heard from one of the breakout, breakout sessions was just the, uh, the, the necessity of having uh, opportunities to build that relationship outside of doing the work of the ministry, mm -hmm. eating together, going to retreats together, coming to conferences together, building that type of relationship was a great idea that I just heard recently mm -hmm. that, that would help you when you do get in those moments and you have to have words with one another. That's good. Mm-hmm. Other thoughts, criticism from an elder, from your team. My topic yesterday for the breakout with nine marks was working for unity amid disagreements among fellow elders. Uh, Perfect. Okay. I, I think I gave seven things on uh, in the moment, but I told the guys the most important thing I think I have to say to you is build the relationships ahead of time. Work so similar. Work for unity before the moment of disagreement, mm. knowing that the thickness of relationship will enable the relationship to be improved by that criticism, that disagreement, that tension, and the thickness of the relationship can even encourage that instead of sending it back underground. Mm. So I, I do think it's very worth investing in the the thickness of the relationships between pastor and elder, pastors and elders, that we can weather those things together, those disagreements, those criticisms, and actually mine for the conflicts. Because the relationship's in good shape, we can see a furrowed brow and say, hey brother, tell me about that. Mm. Instead of trying to avoid it, let it go underground until it comes back up mm. in a bigger way. Mm. I think... I think that's a great point. Mining for conflict. I, I think, you know, that's how you get healthy conflict is you actually look for the areas where you have that areas of disagreement. But the, the trick comes with what if you actually have a fundamental difference on some foundational things? Like, what do you do then? Mm. It, it's not just general criticism. I didn't like your sermon. I think you should have said it this way, but like we see the world differently. Mm. And this is like, ground shaking kind of like we should not be on the same team kind of stuff. Like what do we do then? Because all the building up of the relationship doesn't help in that moment. Mm -hmm. It helps, but it's not ultimately decisive. And so I think the, the question there is you got to really say, let, let's understand the issue as well as we can. Let's give that time. Let's give it patience. And then at the end of the day, you have to determine at what level does this fall? Is it a place where someone needs to step off the council mm. because they can no longer in good conscience serve with these men? And I think they should be willing and ready to do that, to tender their resignation if they say, this is where our church is, I've changed from that, or I, I don't agree, a and not blow up the council in order to do that, but actually have the integrity to step off at the right time and realize that that's a first tier issue, or at least it's a second tier, but it really is important for how we run the church together, mm. how we lead, how we shepherd, how we look at the world. And so I think just having that level of honesty to say, are we all willing and ready to mm. do that when the time comes, if the time comes to say, 
that's really significant. And if we can't come around to that, th th then we're going to have to step off. And, and for example, we had an elder several years ago that just said, I don't know if I'm a Calvinist anymore. Mm. As I've studied, as I've looked, I, I just don't think I can sign off on the elder affirmation of faith. And it was heartbreaking because he was a dear, dear brother. And he said, I think I just need to step mm -hmm. off. And we said, we think you're right. After a season where we walked with him and studied and looked and it was eventually, yeah, I think you do. Mm. So it's really helpful. An option might be, look, this disagreement is intractable and in humility and for the good of the church is saying, all right, I'm going to step aside. God doesn't want me to use my elder gifts here at this time right now. That's, that's helpful, Stephen. Other thoughts on this? Just the weight of disagreements with your team. Any other thoughts on this one? Well, I would encourage <clears throat> you not to build a staff that is diverse theologically. Don't even go there. Hmm. I mean, it's been a long time. I've been in, in, in our little bubble of reality for a long time now, but at the beginning of my ministry, that was considered a plus mm -hmm. by a lot of pastors in my denomination. Have diversity on your staff, theologically. That's a, that's a prescription for chaos and for catastrophic conflict because these elders, namely pastors and lay elders, are the teaching office of the church. You can teach one thing, I'm gonna teach another thing. Mm -hmm. So you, you escape a lot of conflict by building a unified staff. Now that's very different than a unified church. You expect from baby Christians to Christians coming to your church from all kinds of denominations, you expect them to be all over the map theologically and over five, 10, 15 years, from teaching from the pulpit, you hope many of them would grow in the, in the truth that you see. But as far as the staff, avoid conflict by building a unified staff. And that doesn't mean unified personality, mm -hmm. it means unified theologically and, mm -hmm. and philosophically. And then the, the, the second thing would be that if you're a strong leader, and, and everybody on this panel right here is a strong leader, when, you, when, when we walk into a, a meeting, people know that they kind of defer to, to us. There's the leader. That person has to work hard to draw out statements. Mm -hmm. you, if you just assume that being there, people are going to volunteer their criticisms or their suggestions, mm -hmm. that's naive. You've got to just go one by one. What do you think? What do you think? Mm. And I'm more conscious of that now than ever because I'm not in that position in certain settings. I want to be, you know, I like, I'd like to lead this meeting, but, but I'm not. And so I'm thinking three people here haven't said anything and I know what they think. Mm. They got to talk here. Come on, come on. Mm. Somebody call on. Yeah. You got to, you got to draw people out. I mean, if, if you're, if you got three people on your staff or two people on your staff, draw them out. Mm. That's so good. I, and I suspect the guys that aren't being drawn out for you, lead pastors, they're frustrated. Uh, they got stuff they want to share and they want to kind of have your permission. Maybe, maybe they're waiting. Maybe you've got to cultivate their freedom to share. And it's frustrating them right now not to be able to kind of speak their mind. So that idea of, all right, what do you have to say that can really serve them? That's really good. And I like this idea of Theological unity, dispositional diversity, I think that can really serve. Different giftings, different dispositions, personalities, you're all on the same page theologically, but man, are we served by different kinds, ways of being, different instincts. That's helpful. Okay. I'm about to move to something else that I think is kind of interesting, but Lou, you look like you're ready to say something. Well, I'm Let's thinking go. about the, the theological unity, the importance there is is absolutely the right, right thing to state. And I, but I sit there and think, what happens when people up on your, your brothers on the elder board, you, you have theological unity, but you may have different perspective on all type of issues, a, a cultural issue. Put the, put the cultural topic on the, on, the, on the table. We all share the same fundamental beliefs, but we are on two different equations when it comes down to put whatever the topic on the table. And that's the thing that's causing the eruption mm. around the elder board. Mm. That, that's, that feels tricky mm. when it comes down, mm. come down to us. Mm. It put whatever topic, it, and yeah. we've, you, know, you have two camps there. Yeah. All share the same theology, love it. But we are on different pages here on the elder board. 
and that's going to even that's that's just a microcosm of the same thing going on in our yeah. congregation. I mean, you named some of them in your sermon today. Yes. You're to this or you're to that. You went through a list of them, mm -hmm. and I suspect that kind of stuff characterizes these guys, elder teams. Different instincts for a cultural moment. Cultural moments. Not a statement of faith thing. There's going to be conflict. Yeah. Lou, any, or any of you guys, any insight? That's a real live issue these guys are dealing with. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm asking y'all. You know. <laughs> I think we're the panel. I'm, I'm, I'm we're the, you're <laughs> the answers. So, yeah, that's right. John was going to say something. Were you going to follow up? I think about the issues where a couple of brothers and I, uh, my brothers around the, the elder table are, find ourselves in different spaces. It, it really boiled down to some things we've already talked about. We really, we got to lean on the relational depth that we have. We have to put our cards on the table about what we feel about this issue, not trying to be fake about it. This is what I think about this issue. And then find out where we are on the spectrum to be able to agree or disagree. And then also, uh, I think what we've learned as elders of Jubilee, to also communicate to our, our congregation where the elders are not on the same page about this, mm. right? So, so they can at least not think that, we, that we're, we're a unified mm -hmm. front on this particular issue. That's not the theological unity here, but it's some sort of response to some sort of cultural peace. Has been some ways that we've tried That's to- That's helpful. Try Mine to, for the differences, yep. and then try to do a little triage with them to sort of see how significant they are. Where they are. Okay. Yeah. And we're still trying to figure it out. But that seems to be one of the bigger issues that we have to wrestle That's with. That's good, things, Lou. Particularly around mm -hmm. cultural issues. Mm -hmm. One related uh, idea is y you have to judge how important is it to actually wrestle to the ground. Because you might have a lot of ideas on a lot of things, a lot of cultural issues, but do you really need to deal with it within the church at that point? I remember an illustration you did at probably a, a panel like this where you talked about cow patties. Uh, you know, you and your wife are fighting over something. We don't need to fight over that right now. Let's throw it in this lump over here. A and there might be some things like that for your elder council. It's out there. It's going on in the world. Yep. Christian nationalism. Like... We're not waiting for a Christian prince. We get to pick between Trump and Biden. Like, that's our choices right now. But like, and you might have different ideas on that, but you don't probably have to exactly figure out every single view of where you're at on that issue because it's really more conceptual. Now, it might be good to continue to learn and figure out and mm -hmm. understand one another, but I, I don't know how helpful it is at that particular moment to say, here's our unified elder statement mm -hmm. on that issue. Mm -hmm. You just can't do that with every issue that comes mm -hmm. down the pike. Mm -hmm. And it feels like you need to have that freedom to be able to say that this is not an issue that we have to figure out at this moment, mm -hmm. to not feel the pressure. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you're going to social media here at some point, but mm -hmm. social media creates the pressure of yeah. saying, I got to have a statement about yeah. everything as soon as this thing drops. And if I don't have a statement about it, then, then, yeah. then here comes the horde. Yeah. And to feel that pressure, to not even feel that pressure amongst the body or amongst the, the eldership, I think is a sense of freedom that, that we need to continue to cultivate, that we don't need to have an... We, uh, we, we may not be prepared to have a statement about everything mm -hmm. and rest in that freedom. Which was kind of refreshing. David said that in his message today. You can come into the church, and, Pastor, what do you think about it? And you're like, man, I don't know about, I don't know anything about that. It's so good to create like a culture where you don't have to know about everything. It's not you being negligent. It's you paying attention to the proper things that you need to be paying attention to. And you're teaching them. Look, by what you're attending to, maybe where their attention should be focused. Oh, that was good. That's freeing. I think that should free these guys. You don't have to know about everything. Your uh, perspective on Myanmar, I'm just pulling that out. I don't know if, you know what I'm saying? You, what do you think? Well, you don't have to have an opinion on that kind of stuff. You, you pay attention. You try with God's help and your elders. Um, help to pay attention to the important stuff, and you can be blissfully ignorant about things, right? All right, let's talk a little bit about social media. Uh, maybe I don't want to talk about it, but I think we should. Social media can be a place uh, where you guys are criticized, and sometimes it's not direct criticism, but it's a proxy battle, where there are people in your church are out promoting ideas that are divergent from, incongruous with the kind of things you're trying to do as a pastor. How do you, what do you do with social media? Help us. What, what advice could you give? 
What about as evangelicals in 2024, we all just stay off of it for an entire year? Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Honestly, well, never mind. I'll let John make pronouncements like that. Go ahead. What? I want to, yeah. I'll jump in real quick. Uh, and this is, I'm not saying everyone should do this because I don't think they should, but this is just what I do, which is I don't do much in that realm. Uh, I try not to consume as much in that realm. And I mainly think I don't want anything that I tweet or post or whatever it is to compromise the ministry that I'm going to bring mm -hmm. on Sunday when I preach to my people. When Amen. I say, thus saith the Lord, I want them to have full confidence that I'm true to God's word. So well, whatever else happens out there it is secondary mm -hmm. to my ability to be able to sit across from the family that's heart is breaking over whatever the issue is or to stand up in the pulpit. And, and I want to make sure that doesn't compromise that. Mm -hmm. Now, other people might have different strategies of how to handle that, but that's the way that I generally have operated to say, I, I want to handle myself in such a way that anyone can hold that up in church and it would be fine. Mm. I think there might be also a place to, particularly if I'm thinking of one congregation member comes and say, hey, pastor, did you see what such and such posted on mm -hmm. such and such? And to turn around and say to that person, well, did you go talk to him? No, I ain't talked to him. Well, you should go talk to him. Mm. You should go talk to him and try to discern or ascertain why they posted it, what was the, what was the impetus behind it. That, that first step of in relationship, trying to clear up and understand, seeking to understand why somebody yeah. posted what they posted, yeah. I think is a healthy thing. They're trying to escalate it by coming right to you. Trying like, to escalate it. Coming let's to bring in the big guns. Yeah, and you yeah. say, no, do this the right way first. You go talk to them first and figure out, That's good. Figure out what's going on first. Okay. A good impulse there is when something starts popping in the digital realm there, I mean, related to your analog church, mm -hmm. Draw it back into the real life. Draw it back into the face and fa face to face. That's a good impulse. Mm. Yeah. There are there are things God takes care of as you continue in your faithfulness as well. So uh, we had some some folks that were starting to chirp a little bit online, and we did a sermon series through First Timothy, which included chapter two. And we didn't mean to run them off, but that's what happened. Uh. We're, we're all like, it. can you tell us more? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it was amazing, too. It was in 2019, and so we didn't have to deal with them in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was God's goodness to you, brother. Uh, other thoughts? Michael, I'm curious, across the pond, I don't know what social media involvement is like in the UK. What, what kind of advice do you have from that perspective? Any, any insights? Uh, we do have electricity in the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you think I'm rubbing in 1776 right now, okay? Uh, do you do? I, I think um, a, a reason I've been a little quiet the last few minutes is because I've since we're sort of touching on cultural moments yeah. that are particularly American, mm -hmm. and therefore I'm immediately feeling I'm just not up with these things. But actually, w while I'm aware of what some of these cultural moments are, they're different for us. And, and th that knowledge that I can speak about God's word, but I'm not aware mm. of the finer points of cultural moments in a different country, actually pushes me back to some pretty basic guidance mm. for how I can think about um, social media when there are people all over the world who are going to be listening mm. with different cultural moments. Mm. And this doesn't mean I will always be heard right. But it can be very simple guidance that in my use of social media, I have two guardrails. Love God, love your neighbor. Mm. And are you seeking to do both in that? Mm. So am I seeking in my use of social media to glorify God or to glorify myself? Am I seeking to build up the church or am I seeking to build up myself? Mm. And I simply cannot be aware of every uh, cultural fight, every moment, every issue that people are 
who are going to be listening to what I say are battling with, but I can seek with my contribution or my reaction to anyone else, mm. whether that be a criticism of me or um, they put something on social media and I'm wondering if I re respond. Those are the very, very simple biblical guardrails. Am I glorifying God or glorifying myself? Am I loving my neighbor, loving the church, or am I just loving myself? It's mm. helpful. Uh, backstage, Michael, you had said something about wanting to talk about not just receiving criticism, but w what about advice and insight on actually responding? When someone criticizes us, uh, how do we go about responding? We want to show them we're listening, but there are times when we want to say things for the sake of truth and so justice maybe. What, did you have insights on that that you wanted to share? Well, I, I think it, it would be um, really guided by those, those very simple principles. Yeah. Um, that as I'm seeking to respond to someone, am I seeking to win an argument for my own glory? Mm -hmm. Am I seeking to um, parade myself or my knowledge? Or am I seeking to build them up? Or am I, it might be that they will not listen, but I could be building up others mm -hmm. who hear me. And am I, in my answer, glorifying God in what I'm doing? So therefore, if God is impugned, that becomes a motive to me to want to set the record straight yeah. so that God in his glory is truly seen. Mm. And that this false view is, mm. is undone. And so th those very, very simple biblical guardrails, I think they should be guiding how we're conducting ourselves um, on social media yeah. and in our conversations where we're wanting to critique someone else, but also how we're responding mm -hmm. to criticism. Mm -hmm. Any insight also on wanting to kind of just explain yourself? I feel like that's often what we want to do. We get criticized. We don't want to look defensive. And so sometimes we don't say anything, so we present humble. But is there a place to try to explain? Here was what I was trying to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you guys, what, how do you navigate that? You don't want to look defensive. You, you, you do want to be humble but you want to give a fuller picture. Is that something you guys kind of wrestle with? Well, isn't that, isn't that driven? Your, your answer to that is driven by, is this for the glory of God or not? Okay. So am I seeking to respond when someone's misunderstood or critiqued me? Am I seeking to respond to show, mm -hmm. you misunderstood my position. Good. Good. And I will defend my position. No. But... If God's glory is being impugned, now I do want to step in. Mm -hmm. So you can misunderstand me and you can impugn me. Mm -hmm. And those are the times where it's right for me to be able to say, okay, there, there are times I'll, I'll just back off here and shut up. Mm -hmm. But if God is being impugned, if people are being hurt, that's a right time to step in. It's mm, helpful. It's good. Anybody else want to add on to that before I kind of turn us in one final direction? Well, I'm just trying to think what these guys, what questions they might have. And here's what comes to my mind is when I became a pastor in 1980, there were no personal computers and there was no Internet. There was no email and there was no social media. And I preached on Sunday morning. I preached on Sunday evening. I gave a devotion on Wednesday night. And, and I was so busting with things I wanted to teach my people that I created a weekly mailing called the Star, the Bethlehem Star. I thought that was creative. <laughs> and, and every week they received a gray sheet of paper, gray and red, and I decided on the colors, and it had a one-page article about God or life. Most of those today are solid joys. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the moral of the story. I was not writing those for anybody but our 300 people. Mm. That's all. I didn't even give a thought to anybody else reading those. This is my flock. And that's the way I think you should think. 
if, if you create a website or whatever, create it for your people. Don't create it for me or, or Chinese folks or f folks that you want to blast politically. Do it in your flock. And you know what's going to happen is maybe what you say to your flock, others will find helpful. Mm. And they'll tune in because they can get at it if they want to. And if God does that, that might be a calling on your life to have a wider ministry. But if not, don't thrust yourself into the world. I think that's one of the biggest differences between when I started and when you guys are starting. You guys can become immediate celebrities, right? You can, you can say something crazy on TikTok or whatever, and, and 10,000 people will think you're cool. I couldn't do that, which was a great blessing. Mm -hmm. And so serve your flock. Let that be, along with the criterion of, am I answering to the glory of God? Am I answering for my people? Am I protecting them from this terrible book that was just published? Mm. Should I write a review of this? Well, yeah, for your flock. Mm. Write a review for your flock. Mm. What about this awful thing that was just said on the internet? Do they even know about it? If they don't know about it, no. You don't need to say anything. But if half your congregation is buzzing with this controversial thing that was just Talk to your flock, minister to your flock. And, and if you're faithful in that, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. Amen. So that's the pattern I think you should think when it comes to social media. Calculate how can I best serve my people, not how can I become known among evangelicals. Amen. That's good. Let's, let's do this. We're going to do kind of a rapid fire. Each of you think of one thing you can share with these folks out here. I suspect some of you are feeling awfully discouraged. On the discouragement scale, you're like, if 10 is not at all and one is you wanna quit, some of you are closer to one than you are to 10. Uh, there are things you're seeing in your church, there are things you're seeing in the Bible, there are things you're seeing in the world that I think you could say beyond what you guys, you three have already said from the pulpit, which has been very encouraging. There are things you can say that would encourage these guys. Why don't we just kind of pop, 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 and then, Pastor John, if you would pray for their perseverance in pastoral ministry, persevering and joy in the Lord. When we're done, I'll point it to you. I'll say, can you pray? And then I'm going to talk about a book, and we'll be done. So we don't have to go in serially in order, but something to encourage these guys. I'll go. Whenever I see you, I think about Hebrews, and our shared love of Hebrews. And we just finished preaching through Hebrews, and man, chapter 12 is so good. Mm -hmm. For those who have grown weary or are growing weary and faint-hearted. Uh, so the obvious ones, one and two. Verse three, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Mm. Boy, that puts the thorns and thistles of our vocation into perspective. Mm. And then, what is it, verse, verse 12, uh, lift your drooping hands. I, I take this as hope. Don't hear it as law, hear it as hope. Good. Lift your drooping hands, strengthen weak knees, make straight paths for your feet so that what has been put out of joint may not be lame. What is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Mm. You can, you can run again. That's how the chapter starts, Hebrews 12, with running. And the hands are down. They can be lifted again. The knees can be strengthened. God loves to do it. He loves to heal. I pray he'd do that. At the Give conference. you a second wind. That's right. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Mm. Lou's ready. Let's go. I've been deeply encouraged at our church with a deep desire to pray more congregationally. Mm. I want to encourage that to you brothers. It's just a congregational prayer or setting aside times throughout the week for you all to gather as a congregation and pray more. That's just been a great encouragement to my soul this, uh, ever since uh, this year started, and I would commend it to you. Wonderful. Maybe one thing I'll say is uh, I shared this with our congregation at our congregational meeting on Sunday, but God is working in a million ways, and you don't see it. And every once in a while, he gives you a little glimpse, and then you think, oh, he was working. <laughs> and so, you know, in 2019, someone comes in, above the knee amputee, uh, major pain, chronic, 18 months, losing all hope. Me and a few pastors, elders, we gather, we pray, and we, I follow up and I say, anything happen? And they said, well, we're going down these pathways to see if some of these diagnostics might help and we're not sure. 
I don't hear from them. They moved away. I get an email this past week and they say, uh, by the way, after you guys prayed in 2019, uh, I found healing from that, from, oh. from the various doctors and mm. the various treatments and, and I'm all better. Mm. I find out four years later. And then she says, uh, and by the way, I have an unbelieving coworker who's still in the Twin Cities and she's going through deep waters. They're not believers. They don't go to church. They never read the Bible. I asked them if they would be willing to get prayer from uh, my former pastors uh, and she's willing. And so I meet with her after church on Sunday afternoon. I share the gospel. I give her a Bible. I say, start in Mark. Uh, you've never read it before. You can read from the beginning, but it's a little confusing. Start in Mark. And, and I hope to see you next week. And, and we trust that the Lord's going to work through the seeds of the gospel that were planted. So y y you're ministering, and it looks like fallow ground. Mm -hmm. Nothing is sprouting up. But every once in a while, there, there are roots that are going deep and then something springs forth, and God is doing a million things, and so be encouraged, he's working while we sleep. Mm. Mm -hmm. Related to that, um, building on my text from last night, all things for the church. Friends, whatever your situation right now, God is using sovereignly all things for the good of his people. Meaning that your tears, your pains are never wasted, but keep in step with the spirit. Keep walking in communion with God and the very afflictions and weaknesses that discourage you may well, and historically through the church, you can see so often have been, the very weaknesses of God's people have become their greatest strengths in the service of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Those blemishes they've struggled with, that the weaknesses become the ways in which they can most minister to weak people. And therefore, don't be too deeply discouraged by your own weakness, your own frailty, fragility, corruption, in the sense that walking with the Lord, keeping in step with the Spirit, He can sanctify those very things to make those things that upset you, that, that the sin that grieves you, that grieves the spirit so much, can be the very thing that becomes the greatest mark of beauty in your character, and could be the way in which you can most tenderly minister to your people. Mm -hmm. I was at table talk an hour ago with a couple dozen young guys, and, and they, were, they were probing into Michael Reeves talk last night about, so where does that come from? How, how can I rise into that level of sight yeah. of the greatness of Christ and say things of similar spellbinding effect that we all felt? And um, one of the things I would say now, and you can, you can tell me if this is true, is this fellow didn't come out of nowhere. He drank deeply. He has drunk deeply at certain wells. Yeah. If you listen carefully, you can hear the wells. And, and here's what I mean by that. And he can choose to say what his wells are. But my wells, one of the old Puritans said, I keep a copy of Calvin's Institutes on my bedside table because I want a little taste of Calvin before I go to bed at night. Now, now Calvin has never done that for me. <laughs> Edwards has. Mm. Owen has, and just about only those two. Mm. You, you men must find the wells you're going to drink at. The Bible is the main well, but God has ordained that there be teachers in the church. Some of those teachers have been granted extraordinary insight, the kind you heard last night that didn't come out of nowhere. So find your well. It might be in Edwards, it might be in Owen, it might be Spurgeon. It, it just, just the, these, most of them are dead. There, there aren't any living wells that are worth reading, I don't think. <laughs> Not every night on your bedside table. 
But there are dead wells that have proven themselves over the centuries as such extraordinary sights of God. So by way of encouragement, after you leave this for the next 40 or 50 years, I used to say, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shepherd, and on Monday, I'm a sheep. I need a pasture. I need a stream to drink from on Monday. Where am I going to drink? And, and no living people were doing it. I needed to go back 300 years and drink from certain wells. I still do. I have an iPad. On that iPad, I have Logos. On Logos, I have Edward's sermons by the hundreds. I can pick any of them. And it's just something about Edward's that, in, with all of his flaws, sees God in a way that awakens in me something. I want to keep on doing this. Mm. I want to keep on seeing this. I want to keep on saying this till the day I'm dead. Yeah. Thank you. Why don't you pray for us? Now I'm going to say a little something, and then we'll close. Father, whatever it is from each of the encouraging words that these brothers have just heard here at the end, whatever it is, Holy Spirit, apply to their hearts right now so that they find the grace, the strength, the joy, the faith to go on. And to go on with joy and to go on with power, oh, grant them fresh levels of effectiveness in their preaching, in their organizing, in their counseling, in their evangelism, in their mission mobilization. Grant them great new fresh levels of effectiveness so that they can taste your work, your power in their lives. Thank you so much for what you've done in the first messages. And be honest, Lord, for the rest of this conference to keep doing what you're doing to strengthen our hands that we might press on in this greatest of all works. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.